Okay, so we can start. Uh, good morning or good, good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to this new webinar. And um, today uh, we have the pleasure of inviting uh, Professor Jose Abel from uh, Los Andes, Chile. And he will give us this presentation about this new method he developed for open seas. And now he's putting also an interface inside STKO, which is called DRM, the Domain Reduction Method. So, Jose, please, the stage is yours. You can start whenever you want. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Massimo. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you, Osdea, for hosting me. And uh, thank you to my university also for giving me a space to do all this stuff and being okay with uh, me collaborating with so many people. Not being okay, actually encouraging me to do this kind of thing. So it's a great to be here at Universidad de los Andes in Chile. So today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, high tech fidelity seismic analysis uh, with the domain reduction method. And uh, so the, the, okay, let me, my slides. So the outline for today is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about soil structure interaction modeling. So how DRM fits within uh, soil structure interaction. And then we're going to have an intro. I'm going to attempt to give a, a theoretical intro into DRM. You, you'll find the theory to be quite pleasing and beautiful and very nice. So uh, this is the first time I'm going to be explaining DRM actually uh, at a theoretical level. Then uh, we're going to introduce my tool, uh, Shaker Maker, which helps to generate uh, data sets for DRM analysis, uh, among other methods you could use. We're going to talk a little bit about this important uh, thing that is the, the CFL conditions for weight propagation in elastodynamics. This has been talked before, but it's good to review uh, a little bit about radiation damping modeling. And uh, this is uh, all these five points are going to be hopefully about half an hour of talk. And then we're going to do a semi live demo. And it's going to be semi live because uh, if, if time permits, I am going to set up a model with you guys live, and then we're going to see the results and we're going to do something. So I've run the cases uh, beforehand, uh, and I'm going to be doing some discussion of how to set up these models. Time permitting, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get there. So let's start with the overview. Uh, first, a little bit of uh, ge geographical context. Uh, I'm in South America, in the city of Santiago, in that fringe country that is Chile. And in Santiago, I am uh, right here uh, near the Andes Mountains by the range. This is a, a side view. And the uh, University of Los Andes is there. Can you see my pointer, actually? Maybe I'm pointing. You can see my pointer. OK, great. So then uh, if you zoom into the mountains, you'll see you'll find tucked right at the base of the Andes, Universidad de los Andes. And uh, we have this little campus here. And it's a gorgeous campus. I encourage you to visit uh, uh, whenever you have the chance of being in Chile. Now, uh, the thing here is that this is uh, Santiago. And uh, one of the problems we have in Santiago uh, right now is that we have a little fault over here called uh, St. Raymond's Fault. So it's a surface uh, fault, which has produced earthquakes in the last 10,000 years, but uh, we have no records of it. So basically uh, my ongoing research right now is to do simulation for events in this fault and uh, figure out what happens to buildings if uh, an earthquake were to occur in this fault. So some of my current research questions are, will an earthquake occur at the St. Raymond Fault? Uh, I'm not actually pretending to answer that question specifically, but what kind of motions can be expected? And what's the effect of uh, surface waves? Like we're worried about having a very near field fault produce significant surface waves and how to model those and how to incorporate those into the, into the finite element modeling. And if, if they actually make pose a significant threat. Uh, now our, our codes are designed for subduction zone earthquakes. So one question that arises is are structures that are designed with that earthquake code uh, safe for these types of ev events? And what does safe mean? And what kind of performance we can expect out of structures? Uh, obviously determining where near, near field effects, are they important? How to model them? Yes, no, right? So tall buildings might uh, might experience enhanced rocking due to surface waves. And you also get uh, additional accidental, accidental torsion due to wave passage. Uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit of this, of how it's produced in, in, in a video uh, way down the line. We have no ground motions for these types of events. So the only uh, 
you know, other way to, to produce uh, input for engineering is actually to do simulation. We have no ground motions, we have no GMPs, that means we have to simulate. And this is where uh, DRM comes into, into play. It's part of, the, part of the story. So questions that pop up typically when you're uh, modeling uh, structure is uh, questions like, did you consider so structure interaction effects? Uh, did you include SSI effects? And uh, in my opinion, this way of thinking about the problem is, is it, it can be improved uh, in the sense that when you're modeling a structure, there's, they're always going to be attached to the, to the soil or rock in the best case. And uh, you, if you're deci deciding to fix your model at the base, then you're doing an assumption there but you need to test the validity of this assumption. So always, always think about uh, the soil being as a part of your system and if it's important for your, for your metrics. And in this, there are no recipes for soil, soil structure interaction. There are no, there are a few recipes here and there, but uh, there's no general consensus of when you need to do this, when not. So it, it, at, at practice, what you need to do is try it out, right? So evidence-based. So, uh, where are we? So we want to model basically uh, an earthquake that comes from a source fault, propagates through the crust into the upper crustal uh, soil layers and arrives at a, at a feature that we want to study. So this is our model, a conceptual model of how we think about SSI. And then uh, there's several levels of modeling you can do. I showed this, I'm sorry if I'm repeating stuff from, uh, from the keynote I gave a little bit. There, there's some new content here and there, but. It's uh, my vision overall of how this plays out. So the basic, the most basic uh, model you can do is to attach uh, a non-inertial reference frame to your building base and fix the bottom. And then the earthquake is input as a series of accelerations occurring at each, uh, pl each place of the structure. Uh, the next level is to actually include soil structure interaction or to include flexibility of the foundation. That's, I prefer using that term instead of soil structure interaction. Uh, by using springs, uh, which are linear. You can think about having nonlinear springs at this point too. Uh, there, uh, Davide Gorini does a marvelous job of uh, coming up with new macro models for these types of things uh, that are generalizations of this. So that's exciting work. In this, in this case also, the, the system is still not inertial. So the, the earthquake is input as a series of forces throughout the building. At a level two, you might uh, want to model the soil as a continuum and have a, a, your fixed zone be a, a distance away from the structure. And then in that case, you also have uh, your input being uh, a series of, uh, of inertial forces, but you also have uh, yeah, the soil in a more, more detail. This might be suitable for when you're, uh, when you're considering near field deformability of the soil, but springs might not be enough because, be, because you want to consider maybe interaction between different piles and, or different zones of the structure, uh, among other things. The next level is to forego the inertial reference, the non-inertial reference frame and the fixities at, at the edges and do the, this type of continuum model where now you are inputting your earthquake as a series of traction forces at the base and together with lysomer kulemeyer dash plots at the bottom. And in this case, you usually need to deconvolve surface motions into some depth and then uh, use a velocities uh, times history, multiply that by the density and the shear wave velocity, and then have that propagate into the domain as a plane wave. So this is a, a huge part of it. Plane wave approximation is used. And uh, Massimo has done a, a great job uh, automating this and uh, exploring these type of models in, in SDKO. There's a lot of stuff there and it's uh, very good stuff. And uh, the next level, uh, you might call it level four or level 11, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the next level needs to consider, needs to uh, get rid of this plane wave approximation here. So th that's what DRM is trying to do. So let me motivate a little bit of, of why this is necessary. If uh, you have a, a domain where you have a fault producing some wave propagations and you have a site where you have want to place a structure, uh, if we get closer to the structure, this is a, a video of the same site uh, nearby, you'll see what I mean. The wave incoming, it has several features. There is a complexity to the wave. So it comes at an inclined angle. It doesn't not uh, propagate vertically. 
uh, there's some surface waves here that produce enhancements and there's overall complexity in the motion nearby. So this is a 3D phenomenon, even though this is a, a 2D simulation, it shows you how complex the uh, incoming seismic wave field can be. So this is what the domain reduction method wants to, wants to solve, how to input this type of motions into a finite element model of some feature that you might wanna have there. So how do we deal with spatial complexity in the input field? Uh, how do we do this? So the answer is uh, domain reduction method. And uh, what I'm gonna do today is uh, introduce the domain reduction method by following uh, Jacobo Bielak's uh, derivation. It's a beautiful derivation. And so this is meant a little bit uh, as, a, as a tribute to Jacobo uh, because this is really nice stuff. So, the way this works, and I'm just copy pasting from here from, from his uh, article. If you haven't seen this, this is, this is really nice. So you have a zone, an area, uh, uh, regional scale, and there's some feature you're interested in studying. And in that region, there's a fault which produces motions that are gonna be go going into that zone. So what Jacobo does is uh, he cuts the, a part of the domain that contains the feature he wants to study and separates uh, the domain into an interior region and an exterior region surrounded by a boundary, right? So this boundary is, uh, we're gonna call U the displacements everywhere. So if U sub E are gonna be external displacements, U sub I are gonna be interior domain displacements and the U sub B are gonna be the displacements of the area right uh, at the boundary. And then uh, if you separate these two regions, you obviously have tractions between two regions. So you're gonna have a PV, our forces in this phase over here, and minus PV are, are the forces, the, the same forces applied on the other domain. So the way this works is if you set up a finite element model, uh, you, might solve, you might see an equation that looks kind of like this uh, for the interior domain, where we have the interior degrees of freedom and the boundary degrees of freedom uh, set like this. And for the exterior domain, we have a similar setup. It's the same equations. Uh, the only difference is that uh, you have uh, the boundary forces applied with a negative value here in the, uh, in the other model. And you also have the P sub E, the internal domain, the exterior domain forces. Those come from the fault. So in that previous simulation I showed, uh, I, I used uh, a forces to apply the earthquake. So uh, when uh, you can rewrite these equations and couple them into a, one giant big system, right? And then the, the, the traction forces disappear and all, everything that remains is the, the forces due to the fault. Now, here comes the interesting part. If we go back to the, the, previous, to the previous idea, so we have the split, the, the interior domain and the exterior domain, we can change this part, the, the, the problem with the feature, we can change it for a, uh, free field, if you want to call it model, which does not contain the feature. So it's basically a flat domain, right? And the difference between here and here, you, could, you might see the subscript in the, uh, the superscript zero at the, at the degrees of freedom, and you have some boundary forces zero. Now, the beautiful thing here is that, uh, so you solve this problem, you have the problem separated. This is the same equation as I was showing before, the equation for the exterior domain, and you want to get rid of these forces. So uh, what do you do? Well, if you read the bottom equation, you'll find uh, the forces of the exterior domain are given by well the bottom equation. So they depend on the, on the degrees of freedom of the, the exterior domain and the boundary. And then what you can do is you can place that into the domain, that, the, the equations that contain everything. So you'll grab these uh, forces at the boundary, at the, uh, sorry, at the fault, and you'll place them here on the right-hand side. And then uh, what Jacobo does, which is genius insight, is to separate the, 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 degrees, the displacements of the exterior domain as uh, the displacements of the exterior domain with a flat condition, plus a residual wave field, which contains the perturbation when you've added the perturbation. And you replace, those, uh, you replace that definition here into the corresponding equations, uh, a quick reminder, the, the supra zero uh, degrees of freedom, those are known because you solve them with the flat geometry with the free field conditions. Your new unknowns are the, 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 the perturbations to the field. So what happens is if you do that, uh, you end up with an equation here that has uh, 
some extra stuff here at the, the forces, uh, but and you've replaced the exterior full field with the residual field as a final degree of freedom here. And then you realize that if you add the traction forces that you had uh, considered previously, then these terms cancel out. And, and that's the genius part, because these matrices E, uh, e sub E and uh, with, with a double E sub subscript, those are the full matrices of the exterior domain, whereas the ones that have E and B pertain those the, to those elements that only belong to the boundary. So you end up with an equation like this, where these matrices here correspond uh, to matrices of one layer of elements, only of the elements that have uh, an interior, an exterior node, sorry, an E node, and a boundary node, a B node. So then, uh, essentially, what you've done is you've replaced the exterior, so the the free field, wave field, with a set of equivalent forces, uh, and now you have a, a dual kind of boundary. So you have a the, the previously called B boundary, and then you have an E exterior boundary, uh, which is one element thick. So basically you just uh, apply the earthquake as a series of forces in that uh, boundary. So uh, using DRM is a, is a two-step process. You first simulate your regional wave field. So you do some simulation to produce the earthquake uh, at the fault, uh, propagate some waves into a, a domain which does not contain the feature that you want to analyze. And then you do a local scale model which contains the feature you want to analyze and you input the motions from the regional scale model into the local scale model by using these equivalent forces. And uh, this method is, this derivation is, I, I find it to be beautiful and so simple and one of these things that might occur to any one of us, but it occurred to Jacobo. So all the compliments and, and congratulations to him for, for coming up with that, because this is a very, very powerful method. So, uh, Going back to our level four in our hierarchy, so you basically you're inputting a fully 3D wave field as a series of forces along this one element thick boundary around your soil domain, basically. And then whatever is outside, whatever propagates outside to this domain is this W field. So it's the residual field that you were not considering before, right? Uh, your interior domain can be nonlinear if you want. Uh, your uh, equivalent nodal forces are just that, they're just forces in time. So there's no real overhead into using DRM. There's no specific, no extra computational cost. There's, it's just some forces. And you can use the exterior domain uh, to add damping and to model radiation damping. And that's a nice feature of DRM too, that gives you a rational way or a good way to model the, or gives you more flexibility, more tools than you have before uh, to model radiation damping because, because the, the place in your domain where your input is occurring gets decoupled from the place in your domain where you need to impose static boundary conditions. And that's a huge deal because in the, the models that you had before, you had to impose at the same time at your boundaries, static uh, boundary conditions and also your earthquake. So you had had to like uh, uh, use this, to meet this dual purpose. Okay, so that's DRM. Uh, this slide is uh, just to tell you that the maths of DRM are super simple. Uh, but you need to know, you need to know accelerations and displacements at all nodes that belong to this uh, boundary, one element thick boundary around your domain. So uh, here's another view of a, a nuclear power plant that I studied using DRM. There's a paper on this and we showed that there were some important differences in the behavior of nuclear power plants when you consider the 3D nature of the earthquake, whereas when you do a 1, 1D uh, approximation. So uh, really quick, DRM can do a realistic 3D input. You separate input and static boundary conditions and you get additional ways to provide for uh, Raleigh damping, uh, for sorry, for uh, seismic radiation. Uh, so you can do as before, uh, Lysmer Kuhlemeyer, you can do PML, which is something that uh, Pedro Arduino is and Tassiroglu um, Ertrugul ET at uh, at UCLA is, is trying out. And the uh, absorbing exterior domain is basically adding damping to your exterior domain. And you can also use, this important thing, you don't have to do 3D with DRM. You can get the benefits of the split, uh, the splitting of the boundaries by doing traditional 1D analysis. You just need to deconvolve the motions and get a, a plane wave field. So that's a nice thing. There's no overhead with respect to other analysis types. And 
The bad thing is you need uh, big data sets. The data set I'm going to be using today is three gigabytes, and it's a small case, but uh, data is huge. Uh, the data sets need to be simulated. You need to either deconvolve them from surface motions or simulate them. So th there's that. And uh, it's not yet widely supported and uh, a well-known method, but I think it's, it's in many senses, it's uh, the future of uh, simulating these kinds of things. Well, the present, uh, there's, it's, it's getting popular, I think. So uh, when to use any of these levels uh, to simulate, uh, which level is right, it's gonna depend uh, on what you're doing. Of course, there's no general recipes. So did you include seismic social structure interaction effects? It's gonna depend on what you're doing if, if you, if you wanna do it or not. Uh, context matters, it depends on what you're in, what type of structure, what uh, performance matrix uh, you're looking at. So you need to uh, take a seeing is believing approach. You need to do some sensitivity, maybe start by, by modeling a fixed base and then move to a spring or some intermediate condition, see if there's changes into your performance. And then if, you keep, uh, if you're not satisfied with that, you can move up along this hierarchy until you reach the RM. So um, shaker maker, what is shaker maker? I told you about this, you need to generate the motions is part of the, the things we want to do. Shaker maker is a Python library uh, created by, by Jorge Krempien, my brother-in-law at uh, Catholic University of Chile, and my colleague here at Universidad de los Andes, Matias Regabarren, who is a software engineer. We came up with this library, and uh, the idea is that you can specify these scenarios uh, simply in a simple fashion and just simulate it and get DRM data sets out of it. I'll show you a little bit of that. It's a Python library. You can have an arbitrary number of faults and receivers. And the only downside is you need to simulate a 1D crustal structure. Uh, that's the only assumption it makes, but you can do parallel computing with this. So it's fast and uh, you'll generate directly the 3D DRM motions for open seas. Uh, in this case, we simulated a, a little basin so we use Shaker Maker to uh, put some uh, area, uh, some distance away from a fault. And there's a, a little feature in there. There's a local scale model, which is a finite element model. And there's a, a little basin, which has a reduced uh, propagation property. So basically you can see all the components of the DRM model. I'm gonna go a little bit faster now in, in, because of time. Uh, we implemented a direct reading of these data sets, H5 DRM data sets into OpenSeas as a new load pattern. I'm gonna show you that. It's called HDF5. Uh, it's based, sorry, on an HDF5 data, uh, data format. And uh, the new uh, implementation is ready to be run in, in parallel by with OpenSeas MP and SP. And uh, you, it, it does a, a, a series of things that you wanna have for DRM analysis. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of this. Uh, these are the results of the basin. So basically at the top, uh, you always want to have a free field model where you get, uh, where you can replicate the motions that you had from your uh, data set. And then you, you want to have the, the model with the feature. And uh, so you can see there's some difference in motion between in, in, the, in the feature uh, between the top row and the bottom row. And if you look at responses at, this, at the middle of the domain, you can see that the FK DRM simulation, which is the dashed line, matches perfectly the open system uh, uh, simulation which uses the DRM input. So this is a validation phase. So you're validating that your finite element model matches your regional model. And then you introduce the perturbation and you're gonna get some differences between the, the two things. Okay. So uh, basically I'm gonna skip this uh, due to time. This is basically how to set up a model in Shaker Maker. Uh, Let's just go fast through this. You, you add layers with their specific uh, velocities and, and material properties. And then you add a point source uh, with a point source command and there's a fault source. You can have more than one point source in a fault to create a, a fault source. And then uh, you can create a DRM box uh, by specifying where you want the box to be. So there's some uh, spatial coordinates and uh, how large you want the box to be and what's the spacing, all these things that you wanna have. And this uh, program will just write your output when, when you run the model. So you just end up running everything. You create a shaker maker model by adding the crust, the fault and the stations that you want to use. And then you run the model and this will automatically generate an HDF5 data set for you to use for simulation. And uh, 
Also, we generated a, a new plugin for STKO so that we can facilitate the use of these data sets within the context of finite element modeling. The plugin lets you move the box around, scale it, and just make sure that, uh, that your motions are matching your, your finite element model. And uh, finally, the, the main open source component to use H5DRM is this new pattern called H5DRM, uh, which takes uh, an input pattern tag like other open source commands. You give it a data set, and then you have a series of options to, to amplify the motions, uh, to change the scaling factors of the, the model, and, uh, and you know, uh, transform coordinates and move things around. There's a, a series of options. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, uh, so we had uh, an ongoing agreement with ASDEA, uh, with Universidad Los Andes, and we had some visiting students. You can see Alberto, who is listening now in, in this Zoom chat. And Omar went there uh, in July this year. So they spent some time playing with these things. And uh, I just want to uh, make mention of that and uh, appreciate uh, ASDEA's um, collaboration with this or, or you know, uh, willingness to collaborate with us in this. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, CFL conditions and then I'm gonna skip the part of radiation damping altogether. But this, this part is gonna be important. It's gonna be quick. So CFL stands for current free Levy conditions and it's, it's basically how to set up your mesh so that it can propagate waves correctly. And here I am stealing stuff from Alberto Hurtado's thesis. So I'm gonna place Alberto right there in a the corner to attribute uh, the stuff to him. But the idea is as follows. You have to specify your mesh size and you have to think about it in terms of the waves you want to be able to resolve. So it's not enough to have, let's say, four points here. You won't be able to resolve this wave nicely. Uh, so if you want uh, to be able to propagate this wave in a domain, you need to have several points. How many? Uh, it depends on who you ask, uh, but uh, a criterion kind of looks like this. So you want your delta, your, your wavelength, your, your smallest wavelength, which is going to be your shear wave velocity, your minimum shear wave velocity in your domain, divided by the maximum frequency you want to propagate. So that gives you the wavelength. And then you want to have N points in there. And a typical rule of thumb for that is N equals 10, I like to 20, basically. I tend to use 20 points per wave to get a nice resolution of that. So that's so that the wave shapes can look nicely, can look nice, can be resolved by the finite element mesh. And then there's the other problem of specifying the time step. So if your time step is too long, if your time step is too long, it might happen that your fastest waves, now this is bounded by fast waves, might skip more my progress in one time step more than one element size. So you can see here a wave front, and then there's a delta T, and you skipped all these elements, you, you haven't gone through them. So that's a problem. It breaks causality within your, uh, your, your mesh. So the restriction is that your time step needs to be smaller than your uh, smallest discretization size over your fastest uh, traveling wave within your domain. So that way you can get uh, all the time steps moving uh, within one element. So this is, uh, these are the CFL conditions. They're very simple. And uh, we're gonna be using them to set up a model. So let me skip right into the semi-live demo, I, I'm gonna skip all of this. Uh, we can go back with, if there's questions, but I'm gonna go into the demo. Uh, all the files that I'm gonna be using are available now in, in that URL you, that you can see in, in, in your screen right now. It's in my website slash pages slash drm.html. I can send them over to Massimo too if you want to host them in, in, in the SDA website. But, so uh, the setup that we're gonna be using is as follows. It's similar to the one I showed before. We have a site located six kilometers away uh, from a fault, which is buried three kilometers deep. It's a 30 degree angle inclined deep slip fault that generates motions uh, in a domain which uh, has a surface shear wave velocity of 500 meters per second and a bottom crust uh, of 2,000 meters per second. And uh, because of the symmetry of this problem, you only get motions uh, up and down. So then the Z component and to the east-west component. So along the uh, Y axis in this case, note that in this uh, coordinate reference frame here, the Z is downwards. So you have X to be north and Y to be east. And you get so no, no north motion because of how the, this is set up. Okay, so this is kind of on purpose so that we can get a nice 
data set. And these are not, uh, these, this should be a double dot. These are accelerations actually. So you get uh, amplitudes in excess of uh, 1.5 G or about 1.5 G. And this is, the, it is a simplified uh, case uh, for a point source. If you had a distributed source, it might look different. What I do want to mention here is that uh, this, the duration here, it has to do strictly with the layering. So the layering is in fact very important if you want to get proper durations of your motions. So basically if you want to do DRM, uh, get a seismologist friend so that he can set up the, the problem correct. Okay, so uh, with that, I am going to move really quickly uh, show you uh, this. The, this is the script I used to generate that. So it's a very simple Python script, uh, a cross model with six layers. And uh, you can see at the top, I have 0.5 kilometers per second. At the bottom, I have two uh, kilometers per second in the wave. And then uh, after that, you specify your time source time function. Uh, I don't wanna get into the details of this, but it's a, it's a Brune source time function for the point source with uh, one, Hertz uh, corner frequency. Uh, we can talk about that if you're interested. We place that that source uh, some distance, some at, at some depth, five, five kilometers in this case. I said three, but it's five actually. And then uh, there's uh, there's an if condition here. I usually have a, a little condition here where I want to look at the displacements I'm getting before I do a DRM simulation. But then I switch this flag for the DRM simulation to true. And then what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna generate a DRM box, uh, generate a DRM uh, station writer, and then run shaker maker to generate the motion. So it's very simple to set up these, these cases. Now, uh, regarding the CFL conditions, uh, here's a little script. You can have this script, it's in, in my website. So you come into the script with your uh, shear wave velocity and then uh, your, your P wave velocity. This is thought for the for the upper levels. So you have to think uh, these are the conditions, CFL conditions that need to be met in the region, in the local scale model. So it's not at the depth. So, so that's why the VP is, is just 1000 and, uh, and not the, the, the deeper parts of the model because those are not part of the, the local scale model. So I come here with the density and the maximum frequency I'm gonna be using is 10 Hertz. And with that, I can compute a wavelength. I can compute my dx by doing lambda over 20, and then the dt is going to be dx over vp. So I need to get some a dt smaller than this. I run this program, and then what I get is uh, my dx should be 2.5. My dt should be smaller than uh, 0 0.0025 seconds for me to meet uh, CFL conditions. And then I compute uh, from these properties. I can compute the modulus of elasticity and the Poisson's ratio. And then uh, I do a small computation here for the size of the DRM box that I want to use. Okay, so we have uh, plenty of time left. So I am going to actually be doing some modeling in STKO. Let's start a new model. Here we go. So uh, again, we want to have a model that has uh, these dimensions, 100 by 100 by 50. And then I want to have a uh, this dx right here and use this dt to set up. So the way we can go about this, uh, let's go into STKO. Uh, I'm gonna set up a grid here and set it up to be 50 size. So I want the interior domain to be something like this. And uh, that's 100 by 100 by 50 right there. And then uh, that's the interior of the, of the DRM box. And we want to have the exterior domain be something, let's do, uh, I usually want to leave uh, about 10 elements. In this case, it could, it's gonna be like uh, 25 meters. So let's set up a, another region out here, which looks like this and then I'm sorry, Massimo. Massimo must be suffering with uh, with my handling of SDK. I'm doing this live. So just bear with me a little bit as I set up uh, this uh, little model. And then it's probably more efficient to copy this over here and then copy this guy to the other side like this. Oops, I didn't do the copy. 
copy uh, first point and second point. There we go. And then I want one of these parallel pipettes over there. And I'm going to also apply the copy operator. Uh, go there and should be about there and there. And then at the bottom, uh, I should probably, what's the best way of doing this one, Massimo? <laughs> so maybe here, 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 and then go one step down like that. Bear with me. No. That guy, and then that guy, and then let's copy those, copy this one from here to here, and copy this other one from here to, oops, copy this one from here to this point, and we're almost done with the box. Final copy here, and we're putting that there, that one over here, and one final copy from here to here. And we're done with the geometric modeling. Uh, I think I did that in a reasonable time. And then uh, we're gonna have this, uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's do a few things here. Selection sets, I'm gonna add this into an interior domain selection set, like so, maybe select that and grab the rest of that and add a new exterior domain like this, and then make everything visible and uh, merge so that we get a nice mesh. And then uh, in the honor of time, we're still kind of okay in time, but uh, to leave some we're space okay. for some questions. Sorry? Yeah, all the time that you want. Okay, cool. Uh, we need to add, but but still, let's uh, let's not just want to relate uh, everything to the CFL conditions. I want my mesh to be two point five meters, so I'm just gonna take care of uh, the edge seed or maybe supply a global seed. No, let's go for the edge seed, uh, uniform by size, set this to be 2.5, select everything, assign, okay, done. We should be getting a mesh, which uh, is tetrahedral at this point. That's a lot of elements that we're generating, by the way. And I cannot cancel this, right, Massimo? I can answer it, but probably there is some mistake. It is not meshing uh, a, a structured mesh. That's why he's doing the Derone mesh. Yeah. I, did, I didn't set the structured mesh yet. So no, it's pretty regular. That's nice, actually. It's yeah. not a structured algorithm, but probably the interior is not regular. Uh, not... So let's grab the solids and let's go for a structured hexahedral mesh, assign that. And uh, if I build the mesh now, that's much faster and I'm getting yeah. exohedrons. Okay, so that's how to set up your, your mesh. And then I wanna uh, show you one last thing uh, before I show you the, the models I run. Here in, well, you need to set up your, your elements properties, right? Then you need to put in your CFL file, you're gonna need to add an elastic material with this uh, modulus of elasticity, this Poisson's ratio and uh, uh, a density of 2000. But uh, before doing that, or actually I'm gonna, not gonna show that, I, what I wanna show is the plugin for the DRM. So here there's a condition, the new condition, let's call that uh, H5 DRM. I actually used H4, which is an older version. We can add a load force because DRM, uh, sorry, uh, where is this? Generic. Generic. generic, generic DRM, H5 DRM. And here you can pick an H5 DRM data set and I'm gonna use the earthquake one. And that data set, you can see there's some points over there. Okay, so uh, the 
the data set is, is showing up uh, some points there. So we need to uh, set it up a little bit. Uh, so the model was generated in Shaker Maker, which has units of kilometers. So I can set this coordinate uh, scale factor here so that it is actually in meters. Uh, so you can see now the, the box and it's flipped. The reason it's flipped, it's because um, because the coordinate systems don't match between H5, between Shaker Maker and, uh, and OpenSeas in this case. So what I can do here is I can change uh, some, some local axis that uh, can be defined so that we get a, a proper transformation between the, the Shaker Maker domain. And then you can see that the mesh matches the interior and exterior points in the H5 DRM data set. And here you can also have uh, take a look at what the motions look like actually. You can see displacements and you can see accelerations, which are the same ones I was showing before. Uh, we'll be doing a simulation which reaches up to 12 seconds, from zero to 12 seconds. Uh, the rest over here is a, is a garbage. I was doing a, a quick setup of the H ADF5 data set, so we shouldn't be getting that. And it's a it's a it's a aliasing fluke from uh, from the F, uh, FK method used to generate this data set. So with that, you can add that data set, and then you add the rest of your model. You add uh, you specify as always. Um, let me actually bring up the final file. So it should be the soil box. Yeah. Oops. I think you are overriding it. Did I override it? Yeah, because oh. you clicked on save and you clicked on that one. Oops. Instead of open, you clicked on save. That is not good. Okay, let's do something else. Uh, let's open, not the soil box. I'm gonna open the one with the structure, uh, which uh, it's actually a, a more advanced version of the same thing. So it's the same soil box as I have before the same data set so you can see the data set is now uh, set up there and the other things i have set up here uh, the recorder as before i want to show you the conditions so the only condition i have the boundary conditions is fixed at the model edges and the structure in this case is uh, the, that cylinder you see there is uh, nothing more than a concrete uh, cylinder a solid concrete cylinder that is embedded into the soil some extent is going to act as a feature. And I have a, a version of this, uh, which is actually um, a, a, a bigger cylinder. So you can see what happens when the, the feature is, is bigger. As far as, uh, so what else? Uh, the, the earthquake, the fixities, I'm using tetrahedron, a tetrahedral mesh for this one. So it's unstructured inside. Uh, it looks structured in the outside, but it's not actually structured. Uh, crustal properties were, as uh, I, I mentioned before, going on with the data set. Transient analysis here, I'm using uh, basically transient analysis, which with plane constraints, parallel uh, mumps, uh, linear algorithm with uh, factor one. So it's going to be a linear analysis, Newmark method uh, with, with 0.5 and 0.25, and the fixed time step. So it's, there's nothing weird here in the analysis uh, going on. What else can I mention? Uh, I partitioned this model into 32 partitions and run it in the local cluster uh, last night. So let's take a look at some of these results. Let's open the RM results first for the free field. For the free field, let's see what happens. Those are the free field uh, results. Let's change here to displacement and show you real quick at another time step, maybe around uh, what happened here. You double clicked it. If you click once again on a notation, yeah, it will expand. Yeah, right. Oh, there, there yeah, is yeah. the slider. I want this one around here. And I want to show you what the model is doing at that point in time. I can add a little factor there. Let's make it a bit bigger so you see what's going on there. And let's uh, get rid of uh, the grid. 
And let's actually get a top view and take a slice through the domain. So I'm going to hide part of the domain like that. So you can see that uh, the, the, the model is moving kind of like a box, like a rigid box, right? This is the just the free field of model. And then if you extract data, let's get some data from, actually, let's get some displacement data just to make sure that we're getting correct results or kind of correct results. So here, let's select some point here like that, finish and take a look at what the, what the results look like. Uh, if you, yeah, you have to close or move the, the script window. Ah, there yeah. we go. So the data kind of match uh, the, the input motion that we wanted, that, that's what we want. So uh, you need to obviously verify uh, point by point, but let's uh, move on to show you a, a video of what the, this animated thing looks like. Let's, let's move this around. So the free field motion is gonna look something like, let's use VLC and set the playback to be faster. So this is what the motion looks like. Uh, and it, you can see there's no motion outside of the box. So there's no residual field, field in this case because the, the crustal properties match the properties with which I generated the data set. But you can see there's wave passage. So there's difference in colors. So there's waves coming in and going and things moving around as we go. So this is not a plane wave coming in and there's waves coming uh, from the surface and from the bottom and from everywhere around, right? So this way, uh, I didn't mention it. Uh, I have 20% Raleigh damping at the outside. I have just, uh, I think, point, uh, point 0.2 damping inside. So there's not a lot of damping in, in here. Uh, and you can see how this uh, model or the earthquake is going in. So now let's add a feature into that. When, when you add the structure, it's going to look like this, open with VLC. So now you have the cylinder. Let's speed up the playback as we go. And you can now see there's almost no outgoing motion, but there is some outgoing motion. It's getting damped. So there's a residual field going out. You can see some, a little bit of the mesh deforming out there, but it's not a lot. It's not a lot. It's the the method is taking care of everything pretty nicely. Uh, and the, okay, now you can see a little bit more outgoing motion. The frequency of those motions are gonna match the frequency of the object you have inside. It's gonna be the radiation of the, uh, of the motions induced by the shaking of this object into the crust and going out and getting captured. Let's try uh, just for fun, uh, a bigger one. There are research questions into how, make, how big to make the, the how, can I, how can I look at this? Uh, open with VLC, how, how big you should make the DRM box in order for it to be reasonable. So let's here go to speed faster. So that's a really big concrete cylinder, which is just uh, ridiculous. But you can see even in this case, uh, DRM does kind of a good job. As far as the displacements go, uh, as you need to look at accelerations and you're gonna see accelerations matching way less. Uh, there's gonna be some mesh effects and some other things, but with some more time I can show you. And you can see the deformation, the outgoing waves out here uh, due to the shaking of the interior of the domain. Uh, even in this case, like it does a, a convincingly good job if you're just wanting to look at it. That's the shaking. Like there's no really large motions out here. So the recipe for the outside boundary as far as what I'm doing lately is uh, 10 elements and 20% damping. That's uh, my research has shown that kind of works. We not, you do need to do some sensitivity on the boundary uh, before. And uh, with that, that is actually my final, my final slide. So if you wanna leave some, uh, some space for questions now, Thank you, Sam. It was very, very interesting. So I think we, we have some time for questions. So anyone who has any doubt, 
Any any question? Please feel free to to ask any kind of question. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> it was very very interesting. Like, and it's incredible. Also, how small is the size of the of the volume compared Lovely. with the this Mercolemeyer? Like, the, it's a, a huge improvement. Also. Yes. Now you do need to take care and look at things. I'm I'm showing nice videos, but you need to look at the time series and you need to take real good care of 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 all the different aspects. So it's there are some things to to think about. Uh, there's some questions, I think. Can I ask something? Of course. Uh, thank you for the very nice presentation and for these uh, amazing jobs. Fantastic. Um, I was just uh, wondering, obviously, the uh, these uh, field of forces is, is computed for a specific uh, fault, if I'm not uh, mistaken, with Shaker Mega, right? Uh, what yes. if you apply a specific, um, uh, let's say, uh, record from uh, you know from a real natural uh, uh, earthquake. So, what is the approach in that case? In that case, uh, it's an open question. The simplest thing you can do is you can assume a plane wave. So, basically, I mean, you can use deep soil or you can use shake to deconvolve the motion and turn a surface wave, a surface record. You can turn it into an equivalent incoming plane wave. So, you can you can still do DRM. With that, but you won't be getting a 3D, a 3D input motion. You would actually need to model the 3D or make some additional assumptions uh, if you wanted the, the wave to be inclined or something. Uh, but it's an open research question. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the, the, from a practical point of view, that uh, HDF5 uh, file, uh, how is uh, is it is it generated? This is the, the ratio. How it's generated? Okay, so. Right now, you, uh, well, for this thing I generated, use a uh, shaker maker. I have a, another tool uh, that is coming that we are working on with uh, Alberto here. That's for doing the deconvolution, doing using shake. So that's I think the most uh, exciting thing from an earthquake engineering point of view is that to be able to just grab a record and come up with an HDF5 data set that uh, create that uh, produces the incoming plane wave field. So that is a tool that's, but that, that is something that anyone can do basically. Uh, if you have shake, uh, you, you just need to specify the data format to be the correct one. Thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, you can, you, you're, in the 3D case, there's other tools. Like for my PhD, I used uh, SW4, which is a finite difference code to model the earthquakes. There's a, a whole different set of other tools that you would be using and not just these ones. Uh, there was another question, I think. Yeah, from Sebastian, please. You can ask a question. Yeah, hello, I have a question. Uh, I am trying to model uh, liquefaction, taking into account soil heterogeneity. And I, I think if I am not wrong, you didn't use uh, any boundary conditions between the soil and the outer domain, right? Nothing between the soil and the outer domain, exactly. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that would be really nice for my my model because often uh, inputting um, uh, boundary conditions is gets like a bit messy. So yeah. yeah, that's that's really really nice, and and I'm really happy to see that you also take into account that like the the faults the that would be also like really really uh, revolutionary. I think. Yeah. So, I Thank you for your, your input. Like in this case, uh, for this basin I showed here, it's basically a bowl of, uh, of softer material. So you can easily replace those elements with uh, saturated uh, elements for UPA formulation or something like that, and have uh, the constitutive uh, model inside be, I don't know, uh, Manzali Dafalias and try to model liquefaction inside that. So you, you, you'll get, now these are all open. I, I haven't seen this done. So, so this is a fertile research field, I think, uh, to start figuring out how to use these models, uh, how big the soil box needs to be, what happens if you have plasticity near the, where the input motion is occurring. I have no idea, but I am excited to, to see people do that. And uh, Sebastian, I think uh, if you want, we can talk about your models and, and set them up. Yeah, thank you very much. You're very welcome. What else? Okay. 
Hello, can I ask something? Of course, David. Great. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, because uh, actually, I, I think that uh, your this approach uh, is very useful uh, to uh, because uh, we can uh, in this manner we can uh, simulate the multi-directional propagation system waves. But uh, for example, I have some uh, uh, curiosities. So the first one, uh, the common assumption that we usually that we usually use in in uh, in, uh, in uh, let's say a coupled soil structure model is to apply, as you uh, showed at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the seismic motion at the bedrock or something right. like that. So in correspondence of uh, a layer characterized by a much higher stiffness with respect to the superficial layers. Actually, uh, I, it seems to me that uh, this assumption, at least in the far field uh, case, uh, this assumption uh, uh, can to some extent uh, deemed valid because for Snell's law, uh, mm -hmm. the propagation is indeed uh, vertical because almost. of the, be, yeah. so almost, yes, of course, so with, with some uncertainty. Uh, so first of all, I was uh, wondering uh, um, which are, in your opinion, which are the cases uh, where these, uh, uh, this effect is instead central. So it, it, it's a key, it's a key effect because actually uh, the one that you showed us uh, towards the beginning of the presentation referred to a homogeneous soil. Mm. Uh, yes, in that case, of course, the multidirectional propagation is a key, a key feature. And uh, this, is a, this is a first consideration. Actually, I have uh, another, uh, another consideration regarding the... Um, uh, um, so the, the purposes of DRM and the coupled approaches. First of all, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, nonlinear devices uh, applied at the base of a structural system, uh, uh, we should consider the input motion not as forces applied to the structure, because in that case, uh, the superposition is not applicable, and therefore uh, we need to compute the response, of this, the response of the structure system. And therefore, using, for example, a macro element approach for simulating SSI, we should use time histories to, uh, to apply them to, uh, to, uh, as representative of the seismic input. Otherwise, we are assuming implicitly that we know the response to the superstructure, and this is wrong, in my opinion. And uh, finally, just a very, very small comment about the DRM box size, because uh, um, actually I don't know, I have no idea what happens if we consider nonlinear behavior uh, of the soil. This would be very, very, you know, we talk about it, this would be very interesting and fascinating, but uh, probably since we are talking about a kind of substructuring, uh, probably uh, the DRM, the minimum size of the interior box so, should be the one that at least guarantees, um, uh, uh, let's say that at least includes uh, the volume of soil interacting dynamically with the structure. So if you, if we talk, if we think about a shallow foundation, okay, no problem, because the, 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 the soil involved in dynamic response of the structure is very small. But if we start thinking about excavations and the deep foundations, in that case, uh, um, actually there are several studies that demonstrate that the soil involved is very large. So this is another, another, another comment that, uh, but anyway, you said very, very thank you because this is very interesting. Thank you, Davide. Uh, just to answer that, that uh, video I showed here, it's actually layer two. Uh, in this case, you can, you can kind of see the, the waves going up and, uh, and kind of bending into the domain. Now, uh, even, even in a perfectly layered case and where, where you have far field motions, you do get surface waves. Right, and those don't come from down. Even those won't have an instant angle from a. Those are going to come from the side of the domain, and uh, so it, in that case, it's going to be a question of look. If you have a, a structure which has a large extent compared to your uh, wavelength, uh, then you might, uh, you know, be thinking about uh, the structure being sensitive to this. If you have a vertically propagating wave, you're not going to produce surface waves. Like your your wave is going to be totally coherent as it goes up and hits the surface and then it comes down. 
So if you're concerned about surface waves, uh, then you know it, the, the the problem is is there. And of course, in the near field, that's uh, and for you know faults like the San Ramon fault that, that I mentioned that are nearby. I, you know, I am right now ten kilometers away from that. Uh, my my building is ten kilometers away from that, so I cannot escape three D effects for that in, in that case. Uh, and then it's also going to be you know how big your structure is relative to the wavelength. In the case uh, of uh, wind turbines, for example, which are really dull, you might get rocking, enhanced rocking uh, due to the surface waves or due to near field effects. So it's it's exciting. I think there's a lot of things that can be explored uh, in the coming, and I don't have time to look at all of them. <laughs> so it's exciting. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, you had another question, I think, uh, this, regarding the size of the DRM box. Yeah, you have a good insight there in the case of excavations. You know, it's it's an open thing. I, I have yet to see a type of parametric study that looks at the different size of boxes and how how well DRM performs in, in those cases. Uh, what, what you can do is uh, you can generate a case. Um, you can actually simulate, you, you could generate the motions uh, for the DRM data set using open seas. There's no, there's no reason why you can't do that. Uh, and you can have a model, uh, a large model, which has the, the little uh, excavation, for example. So you simulate that and you generate your motions, which are consistent with the excavation uh, using open seas. And then you can have a smaller model, which inputs the, those, uh, those DRM motions for different sizes of boxes and see if you're getting the, the same results. Yeah. Something like that might be yeah. Yes, otherwise, in an approximate manner, we can also use indications available in the literature about the volume of soil involved dynamic response, because now we can compute that. So, yes, thank you. I agree. It would be very interesting anyway to compare this with the Leismer Kulemeyer tradition and then see if we can get some possibilities to make the, the size smaller compared to the traditional. Yeah, that's for sure. PML is something that is uh, in open seas right now being developed. So we should have PML type uh, conditions at some point. Yeah, I remember that they were working in 2D. I don't remember if the 3D implementation was working or not, but we have to look at it when we have time. Yeah, Pedro was working on it. Uh, I remember we talked with him uh, last time. And are there any other questions? I forgot. I could have invited him also as well. It would have been nice to have him here. Oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot to invite you. I forgot to write him. And yeah, just a note for everyone. This one that, um, these two that um, Jose uh, showed you is just a first implementation of the interface of DRM in CDCGO. But with, with time, we, we will keep on improving it. We were thinking of somehow creating some interface for uh, the shaker maker, uh, but we still have to think about it. So with time, it will grow, it will become uh, much more complete uh, to, to make it easier to use DRM inside SDK or open seas. Yep, exciting times. Perfect. So if there are no other questions, once again, thank you very much, Jose. And thank for you. everyone else, by tomorrow, we will, well, this one is online on, uh, on YouTube. By tomorrow, um, if Jose can send me the material or we can just actually put a link to your repository, you will be able to download this file. I think the presentation also, yeah. And yes. once again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Jose. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Guido. Thank you, Masu. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.